Hi, I'm Sarah Glassberg. I'm Brad Pilcher. And this is AJFF In Conversation, the podcast, where we talk about all things Jewish film. In today's episode, we are going to engage in some friendly debate about some all-time greats that we kind of hate. Without being too negative, we wanted to explore some of the classics of Jewish cinema that we just don't agree with the masses on. And what will make this really interesting is we probably don't even agree with each other on some of these picks. But maybe we can at least have a healthy vent session, confess some of our most embarrassing or blasphemous movie-related opinions, and perhaps change each other's minds. I'm not totally sure that's possible but it's a nice thought and with that we promise to keep this fairly positive and we don't just mean like i'm positive this movie stinks we can be adults about this but i digress and i am going to let brad go first all right i i will set the mood by picking a film that is a little embarrassing to admit that i do not like um it is a film that that I absolutely should like, if you looked at my biography. Um, the film is Driving Miss Daisy, which, for those who do not know, is uh, an Oscar-winning uh, sort of light-touch film about racism and uh, the race relationship between a Jewish white older woman and her chauffeur, a Black man, in the middle of the civil rights era, Jessica Tandy. Phenomenal actress, love Jessica Tandy, stars alongside Morgan Freeman, an iconic uh, actor and performer and really wonderful voice talent. I should love this film. It's a, it's, it's first of all, it's based on a true story um, and it's set in Atlanta. It's set at the temple, which is actually called for those who are not Atlantans and not Jewish. There's a place, there's a synagogue in Atlanta that's called the temple, just the temple that is in the movie, you see the exterior, you see the interior in the movie. Um, it's, again, based on a true story that took place in Atlanta at the temple. Um, it has the temple bombing. I used to work at the temple years and years ago. So you'd think that that this would be all up my alley. It is not. It is, it is a film that I find dull. Um, I find it a, a bit self-aggrandizing. The problem that I have with this film is that, yes, it is based on a true story, but it is a film about race relations that A, looks backwards, B, is a little bit too much uh, of that sort of magical personal relationship between a black man and a Jewish white woman that's somehow going to magically sort of overcome terrible race relations um, and, and without really ever getting into the power dynamics at play, especially in a movie where the black man is the paid servant of the white woman, um, never really grapples with systemic races and never really does anything except sort of look back with this glow of, about this wonderful relationship that we can all feel good about. And of course, the Academy loved it. And of course, it won the Oscars for Best Picture in a year that Do the Right Thing didn't even get nominated. Of course, it was um, everybody's favorite. But it's just not what we should be championing. And ultimately, I think it's just sort of like a, I don't hate it. It's just kind of a meh film. I mean, it's again, it's got Dan Aykroyd's and it's got a great cast. It's just not a film that inspires in the way that I think it's it, it, the people who are making it thought it would. Um, and certainly I don't think it's held up over the years in a way that a film like Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee has done. And the, and the real issue that I have with Driving Miss Daisy is that it's backwards looking. It's a little, it, it's, it's, it's saying look back and, and look, I, I worked at the temple. I, you know, the temple was bombed. The temple bombing is in the movie. Um, certainly just because she was white, she was also Jewish. She was not fully a recipient of the benefits of being white, but that was a time in, in history when two things were happening that were in tension. On the one hand, there was a lot of people, Jewish Americans who were standing beside black Americans in the fight for civil rights, who were literally marching, in some cases, literally dying alongside black Americans. And we should be honoring that and championing that. And in fact, at the temple, the rabbi at the temple was a leading proponent of civil rights. That's why the temple was bombed. And it's something that we should never let go. But also at the same time, there were lots of Jewish Southerners who were invested in white supremacy, who were 
skeptical at, at best of these Jewish activists, particularly northern Jewish activists who were coming into the South. Um, they were worried they were going to upset the balance. They were going to interfere with the assimilation of the Jewish community into the largely white supremacist society in which they were living. And this is a film that looks backwards at that time in history and doesn't really grapple with that tension a whole lot um, in a way that I feel like is a missed opportunity. When I look at it compared to something like Do the Right Thing, that was a film that is incredibly relevant today, sadly, unfortunately. But its relevance is not just because we happen to have police brutality in the news. It's relevant because it was looking at the now. It was sort of a present film that wasn't looking backwards and doing a little bit of, you know, Halo-esque self-congratulation. It was more a film about saying, this is what is wrong now. This is what we should be grappling with now. And I think it's telling that the Jewish community looks back at Driving Miss Daisy, particularly the Atlanta Jewish community looks back at Driving Miss Daisy with a lot of affection. Um, we're very proud of the film. It was shot here. It was shot in the temple um, based on a story from here. But the black community looks at it and goes, it's a little bit of a whitewash of what the experience was like. So I think Driving Miss Daisy is not a bad film. I don't hate it but I hate that it is as loved and that it is championed as it is, because I don't think it really ultimately deserves it. I think it's a sort of an okay film that is not going to age well. And I don't think really needs to be remembered and revisited in the way that other films at that point in time that were being made, like do the right thing should be revisited because they really hold up. Yeah. I don't think I'm going to, even attempt I don't even want to attempt <laughs> to change your mind on this one I mean the thing I'll say about Morgan Freeman is I feel like he plays that type of character a lot um, which I think is a probably a disservice to his talent and probably just it's an unfortunate pattern right how many films he's in where he plays he fills he fulfills that role for a white character and th- alongside that it's it's such a tradition within the history of the oscars to honor films that look at race relations through a particular lens and from a particular perspective even up until recently with something like green book so i'm right there with you on on everything that you've Uh, yeah (laughs) so i'm right there with you on everything that you've uh this is not one that i will actually debate you on for sure um, it's terrible too. Now we have Black Klansman versus mm-hmm. Green Book. We had Do the Right Thing versus the weird thing about the Do the Right Thing versus Driving Miss Daisy is Do the Right Thing wasn't even nominated. right. So it wasn't like it was in formal contention. They weren't really going head to head. But the fact that it wasn't nominated and this, you know, it's a feel good yeah. film. And should we really be doing feel good race relations? It, civil rights it makes films? a particular kind of person or a particular audience feel good and so i can only hope that we move away from that but again that this is a long-standing kind of tradition in film and a tradition in the oscars which i like to hope changed last year with all of the awards love for for something like parasite um but you know we will see again i'm not i definitely I definitely also agree with, even with Green Book, right? It's always about looking backwards um, through kind of a nice, I guess you could say rose-colored lenses. Um, But the issue of things holding up is where I'm going to enter into this with my pick, uh, my first pick. And I feel really bad saying this because we had it this past year at AJFF as one of our classics. So I watched it, albeit on my laptop, which I think was my first mistake. Um, It's Otto Preminger's Exodus, uh, starring Paul Newman. And, you know, as a now self-described, you know, amateur for fun film scholar, you know, got my master's, like to think I'm open-minded, like to think that I'm, you know, a little beside people in my generation and really willing to watch older films uh this one just i think really belongs to its era um and when i say that i mean it came on it came within the tradition of these huge 
epic scale, beautifully colored, you know, um, films that were really long and had intermissions built in. And we just don't get that much anymore. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say it's the length in and of itself that bothered me. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I took a whole course on Bollywood films. I mean, some of those screenings were four hours long on a Sunday night and I was fine with that. Um, but I just think there's something very traditionally old school Hollywood about this film where I watched it feeling like I was supposed to be learning something about history, about the creation of Israel and just feeling really glossy eyed um, and maybe if I had sat in on one of our screenings of it on the big screen, it would have been a very different experience. So similar to you saying, you know, I'm not going to say that I hate this film. I'm not going to say that I hate this film. But to put it bluntly, on the other hand, I just was kind of bored, um, which again, I felt really bad about. So so I don't know, just this Hollywoodizing of history um, the scale of it being really meant for not just a big screen, but I feel really meant for a big screen back when it actually was released. I, I just don't think it, it holds up in the same way, which is not to say that its quality has in any way, um, you know, kind of changed or diminished, but, um, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of reverse aging myself if that's a thing. Maybe I'm very, um, I'm very much speaking toward like a, a 20 somethings experience of this long epic film that is old. I, I like to think again, that I have a lot of tastes in film that are that, but this one just, I don't know. I just couldn't, couldn't get into it really for lack of a more eloquent way of putting it. The thing about Exodus is there, it, 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 it's you're not supposed to say this, and I, I think there is merit in the idea that you want to judge these older films on their terms in the context of when they were made and the kinds of filmmaking uh, options that were available. Because you know they just they're not the same film, but when you take a kind of epic scale like Gladiator, when you take a film like that that is more contemporary, historical, quote unquote, um, mm-hmm. epic there's an action to that film that you're not going to get in a film like Exodus. And it isn't necessarily because if you remade Exodus today, you wouldn't inject action. It's just that when they made Exodus at that time, that's not the kinds of, that's, first of all, they couldn't do, they, they didn't have the technical capability to do some of the things that, um, that we are able to do in modern filmmaking, but also, you know, they just, it wasn't the kind, it wasn't the tone. It wasn't the rhythm. It wasn't the, what the audience yeah. was not trained to, to appreciate that they were trained to appreciate something else. And so I don't want to say that I think that the film is not as good as people say it was, but I do think that for audiences that have evolved away from that period, um, that it isn't in today's context of, of what modern audiences are used to. It's not going to be received the same way. And that's not a necess- you know, it's not something that should be off limits to say, because it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's a slower pace. It's a, it, it doesn't make it bad. It just means that it might be bored. You might get bored. Otto Priminger is a phenomenal filmmaker. Saul Bass's poster for this film is amazing, but the film itself is a hard pill to swallow for, for modern audiences. I, I think that's exactly it. Yeah. 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 And, and that, again, it's not a critique of the film, right? It's not even really a critique of modern audiences. It's just, uh, I think that we should be okay with that evolution and be aware of it. And, and right. I want, there's films I go back and watch that are black and white silent era films that are, that still hold up phenomenally well. But I find that, I have an easier time getting younger people, getting more modern sensibility audiences to to buy into like a good Buster Keaton film than I do a film like Exodus. And the reason why is because Buster Keaton was like, was the Jackie Chan of his day. You know, like there was an action and a kinetic frenzy to those, to the Buster Keaton films that modern audiences are like, yeah, I'm I'm cool with that. Um, But if you say, I want you to watch a very sort of, you know, Lawrence of Arabia is another one where it's like, oh my God, I, you know, that is not a short, 
short film. It's not a film that most modern audiences can, can tolerate. So it's okay. I do think it's a sad testimony um, about the future of cinema, though, because I do worry that more and more and more, fewer and fewer films will be seen in large multiplex kind of big screen experiences. They'll be seen at home. They'll be seen on a television screen. Um, and that's fine for a lot of films. That's fine for, you know, romantic comedies or something like that. But, um, you know, a film like Exodus, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it needs to be seen in a dark room where you're all going to agree to sit there for the duration on a big screen. It needs that. I think that's exactly it. And I am also, on one hand, I will say I'm eternally grateful to have been a film student because there are probably plenty of other films where I might have had a similar experience had I not had something to supplement my watching of the film, something to teach me about its place within cinema, cinema history. Like, I don't know, I think back to something like Citizen Kane and the fact that my mom, who's a huge film buff, had never seen Citizen Kane. I watched it in the context of two different film classes, once as an undergrad, once as a master's student. And so I look at that film through that lens of what it did when it came out, um, you know, what it meant. And my mom didn't have that. So when she watched it, she was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't see, I don't see the big deal. And so I wonder too, if, if seeing something like Exodus, not just on the big screen, but, but having something to educate me on why, why it's a classic, why it's important, you know, I think that that would help. And so the other thing I was going to say is on, on the other hand, I, I'm also eternally grateful that we have intro speakers at our festival, because again, even though I didn't get to actually be around when, you know, when we showed this, this past year, I know that probably for modern audiences to have someone introduce the film um, to lend that context is probably so helpful. And I know I would have probably benefited from that. So yeah, I mean, thank God for that. Thank God for Turner Classic Movies and the and the introductions that they give to their film. I mean, I think there's look, it, it's 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 a how do I phrase this without it sounding terrible? But you know, the, there are hundreds of movies that are made every year. There are hundreds of books that are published every year. And if you go back fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, a hundred years. There's a lot of books we don't remember, um, a lot of good books, a lot of good movies. And it's just sort of the natural life cycle. And I, I'm not saying that Exodus should go the way of the Dodo, but audiences move on. I think it's totally okay to say that there are some things that, you know, are going to live on in academic settings. They're going to live on in archives and museums and historians are going to love them. But, you know, some things just aren't going to necessarily hold up far into the future. And film is a particularly susceptible medium to that. Um, partly because it's such a technical medium, a visual medium, um, but also partly because it's such a young medium, there's this evolution that takes place very quickly when you're sort of starting a new medium. And so, you know, unfortunately, I mean, forget Exodus. You go back to the 1980s, there's films that you like are painful to watch because the, the tempo and the rhythm are different. So I don't think you should feel bad about, I don't necessarily have a strong opinion on Exodus. I don't love it or hate it. I appreciate it. But, you know, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying because I have the same experience with a lot of films from that era, particularly films that for whatever reason are more methodical in their approach to that to that genre or that subject than a than a similar film that would be that would have been made in the past 20 years would be so i don't feel bad i i will tell you that um i have another pick that is um much more painful to me than exodus was to you because i actually genuinely hate it and it and it's so painful for me to to say that i hate it because i love the director i love the genre um, I think the cast is solid. I think that it's a film that I was super excited to go see when I first heard about it. And I hated while I was in the theater. I remember sitting in the theater and just turning my head to the person next to me and going, oh, I literally said, oh, because I hated it so much. The film in question is Munich by Steven Spielberg. This is um, a film that was made not immediately after September 11th, but a few years after September 11th, when the war on terror was kind of in full 
full swing and full bloom, Steven Spielberg, who had pivoted away from, you know, the E.T.s and the Jaws and the sort of childlike um, blockbuster films uh, that he made his name doing. And he had sort of started his march uh, with Schindler's List and with other films towards sort of more serious adult dramas um, that by and large, I think he's done successfully, but he decided to make a movie that was ostensibly about the hunt by Israeli um, operatives to track down and kill the Black September terrorists who were responsible for the Munich Olympics massacre, which is a historical event. It's a true story um, that, you know, is in a way just deeply riveting. You're talking about spy craft and, um, you know, this, this could be great. And, and as a lover of the spy genre, and there were other films that had come out within a few years of this that were really sort of pushing the spy genre um, to new heights. Spy Game was uh, was a favorite of mine. And, you know, I was like, this is great. Spielberg is going to do this. It's It was also a little bit of a response to the war on terror. Spielberg was really, as were many, many people were just grappling with the way that the war on terror had unfolded and the way that it was affecting the psyche of the country. And so I think he thought this would be a great vehicle to dive into the idea of vengeance and justice and the psychological toll that it takes on individuals as well as societies that are in the grips of that sort of never ending seeming war on whatever the enemy is, terrorism, terrorists. Um, and it just was a miss. It's just, oh my God, it was the most unsubtle film I have ever seen in my life. It was just, it felt like when I was a kid and I was forced to read the Odyssey, I hated it because it was just like, go home already. Just it, we, one thing after the other, after the other, and it dragged and it dragged. And I was like, oh, Jesus, just go home. I felt the same way about this, you know, it, they go after these terrorists, they're killing them after every single time, you know, Eric Bana in the lead role is just sort of like filled with angst and um, struggling and, and is lamenting what this is doing to him. And oh my God. Oh, and they just keep over and over and over and over. And it just keeps hitting you. And I, and I understand, I think on some level, that was kind of the point Steven Spielberg was trying to, to convey, but as a, as an experience of watching a film, oh my God, was this just painful to me. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think most people hate this film to the degree that I do, but um, I don't think most people are going back and citing Munich as, you know, one of the highlights of Spielberg's filmmaking career. Um, you know, we go back to Schindler's List, we go back to, you know, to his early films. Um, but this one just kind of gets glossed over, but it's like, oh my, I, it's got all the seriousness of Schindler's List and none of its deft execution. And I don't, it's just, it's oddly paced. It's just, oh God, I, I, have I conveyed, Sarah, just how much I hate this movie? You have. <laughs> I, I, I feel your, um, your angst right now very much. Um, but wouldn't you say, I just to like counterpoint, wouldn't you say that Spielberg does not have a great track, re track record for subtlety? I just... I don't know. I feel like that, that that's not even no, one of his strong no. suits in general. So to, for this film to really hit you over the head even more than some of his other films, I almost feel like, is that really that surprising? I don't, I don't think it is. I don't I mean, <laughs> like to go back to Schindler's list. Like I, I, I think that film is obviously remarkable. You and I both are agreeing that that is a masterpiece of sorts and shit and isn't a film that either of us picked for this. Um, but is it really as deft as I maybe in comparison? I don't know. I'm again, I will on this Certainly one. I'm not going to comparison to me. Sure. Anything is I'm not going to debate you on this one either, but for a different reason than driving Miss Daisy. This one just feels like a losing battle for me to try to, yeah sway you you've thought about this a lot and clearly um probably disturbed some of your fellow moviegoers at the time with your <laughs> audible reactions um yeah i think also to try oh, yeah. to put I, I mean here's the thing let me, let me just 
defend Spielberg. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to defend Spielberg. Okay. I do, and I cannot, I, 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 I hate that I hate this film because I love Spielberg. Spielberg sure. is not a subtle director, but he's not a subtle director in a way that like Frank, Frank Capra was not a subtle director either, but they, but what they were doing was they were telling a story. They were, they were, they were playing with a medium that had certain conventions and they were, you know, filmmaking is by definition has to be the most economical storytelling medium um, because it is, and music is very short, but music is not meant to be realistic. It's not meant to be, um, it's not the, the premise of music is that it can be metaphorical. It can be kind of amorphous in a way that it, that film is not allowed to be film. You have a very limited period of time to tell a story. And the, the premise of film is that you're going to put a camera somewhere and it's going to capture what's in front of it in a more or less literal. And even though we know there are things like special effects and CGI, the premise, the underlying premise of film has always been realism. And whenever you go a, away from realism, it's a very conscious choice and, and it's, it sort of becomes its own sort of genre. So most, like 90% of films are realistic. Um, the premise is realistic. The audience is expecting realism. So when you have very little time, but you have to be very literal and realistic, you have to be economical. And so there are conventions and Spielberg gets a lot of flack for being unsubtle, but reality I think is just that he hews to conventions that allows you to tell extremely emotional stories, extremely economically. And he does it with a, with a, with a, with a pretty strong visual eye, but not necessarily like a hyper stylized visual flair. And so no, he's not subtle, and he doesn't necessarily have a uh, have a deft hand for ambiguous endings or endings that are meant to leave you on something other than a high note. He definitely has a bias there, but this film is not just unsubtle. This film is a there's a lingering shot. The last shot of the film, spoiler alert, is the effing twin towers looming over New York, and the camera in the most self-conscious way imaginable just lingers there just pans over to the twin towers and lingers there and it's like oh my god that is like an exclamation point in the worst possible way it's just awful i'm sorry i can't do it but i have to defend steven spielberg i apologize for interrupting no you know that that is completely fair i think that explanation is what i was looking for i will also just say that basically any film that is responding to 9-11 or the war on terrorism it up to this point I can't say that it's ever been done well on film whether the film is directly responding to that or indirectly but as you've described here kind of hitting you over the head with it in a way that's meant to be indirect but is actually quite literally hitting you over the head um, in the film I mean I can think of plenty of film examples that are equally unsubtle. And I agree, it's unfortunate that um, one of those films seems to be coming from Spielberg, because I can definitely think of some others that just feel wrong to compare it to. Um, one that I will just quickly mention is, and I don't recommend this film to anyone, and it's not Jewish, so I'm not going to talk about it long, but there is a film called, I think it's called Remember Me, that uses 9-11 as the most kind of exploitative like emotionally exploitative tool. It's a terrible movie. So this conversation made me think of that. And again, it, it is unfortunate to kind of lump a Spielberg film in with that really, really unfortunate tradition that we seem to have so far with, you know, films responding to all of that. So yeah, I, uh, my next film, it's kind of a cheat. I don't have as strong opinions as you do, Brad, on, your last film, but I just wanted to mention that I actually, and this is why it's a cheat, I have never actually finished Annie Hall. Uh, a friend of mine, my best friend, um, sometime while we were in college had tried to show it to me, and for whatever reason, we did not finish it. We turned it off maybe a third of the way through, can't remember why. It wasn't explicitly because I wasn't enjoying it. I 
I guess I wanted to talk about this film because it is a classic. It opens up all these cans of worms that we'll have to do future episodes on regarding Woody Allen as a filmmaker. And can we still watch his films? Can we still love his films? I have Woody Allen films that I enjoyed and like. Um, I really liked Blue Jasmine. That's kind of one that people don't talk about enough. So it's it's not that I've outright tried to avoid his films for as long as I can remember. But now, of course, I'm at I'm at this crossroads where I feel a guilt in having not finished Annie Hall. It's a film that on one hand I think I should see. It's a film I should want to see. Um I think Diane Keaton is awesome in it from what I saw <laughs> and what I remember. Um, but at the same time, I almost now feel like even putting aside the Woody Allen baggage for a moment, I almost feel like that character was a precursor to the kind of manic pixie dream girl we get in a lot of films in the 2000s, which is an archetype that really messed me up for <laughs> a long time. And for those of you who don't know, Manic Pixie Dream Girl. It's this eccentric, quirky female character that doesn't really have much of an interior life and is kind of there for the, the lead male character's own development and self-realization. So uh, we can put in the show notes where that term was coined uh, by a film critic. Anyway, so so there's all of that. There's the fact that it's this classic comedy And I have this nagging voice, like, I should sit down and finish this movie. But on the other hand, I really don't want to watch Woody Allen films anymore. I don't want to give him a personal platform in my, you know, in my time, in my space. I don't want to give him that, um, even with a film that, you know, became a classic of cinema and Jewish cinema before the world kind of woke up to, you know, the accusations and the allegations against him, which I wholeheartedly, you know, believe. So, so yeah, I'm at this weird, this weird intersection point between like feeling guilty for feeling like I should watch it, feeling guilty for not having watched it up to this point in my life. It's, it's weird. And so I lumped it in here because even though it's not something I hate, it's something that is a classic that I just don't have any real desire to return to or or finish watching well i give you full absolution because i i laughed a little bit just because you you talked about feeling bad and the reality is and we should say this because i think it it's true for everybody who's listening if there is a film that you are just not interested in um or there's a film that you start you try to watch and you get and you start watching it and you just are like this is awful don't watch i mean there there are way too many films way too many tv shows way too much literature in the world and and you will never get a chance to sort of absorb anywhere near all of it but not even absorb you know all of what we consider the canon um unless someone's paying you, unless it's for school, like just don't feel bad about, about not watching something because you have ambivalence about it because you know, it's, it's, there's other things to spend your time on. And, and look, I'm with you, sir. I, I remember um, when Hollywood ending came out um, back in 2002, Woody Allen, who notoriously would not travel, would not do press, would not, he wouldn't even go to the Oscars because he would, he was, he had a, a, a jazz band that he would play in that night. Um, and for whatever reason, he went on tour. So I remember I went to a, a press screening of Hollywood Ending, and he was there for a and a afterwards. And he was, you know, he was Woody Allen. He was sort of awkward and and whatever. But I remember, it's a terrible, Hollywood Ending is not a good movie. I think if you looked at his entire filmography, what you would find is that the majority of his films are kind of, eh, they're fine. You know, I think they're fine. I think I like Midnight in Paris the most of his recent, more recent output um, in the past, you know, 10 or 10 or so years, 10, 20 years. But, you know, he made his name in the 70s. He made his name in the early 80s. And by the time he got past that period, he was just, he's just kind of a guy churning out a movie every year or two. Um, He has a sort of system, it's his thing. And, you know, he's Woody Allen. So at that point, it kind of didn't matter if any of his other films were were good or bad. So this this issue of of whether or not we should comfortably want to watch Woody Allen movies is on the one hand, an incredibly fraught one. And I think you're right. We probably should do a whole episode just on on him and other problematic filmmakers. Um, but 
for me, I, look, I'll tell you, I'm not, if all of the Woody Allen films ever made suddenly vanished, it, I'm sure that would be a loss and, and it would certainly have an impact on the influence of, of film comedy. But I wouldn't miss it that much because I think he's overblown. I think Woody Allen is is a is a is a obviously talented writer, middling actor, you know, certainly totally serviceable director who's made some absolute crap, um, and probably has made more crap than. But he's made some gems, and Annie Hall is a gem. But I think the thing that you tap into that is the most problematic about put put aside the allegations about him. And, oh my God, it's who knows because it, it's none of it's been proved, and it is a little bit of a he said she said. But put all that up aside, his he was like a master class in problematic portrayals of female characters in films centered around male protagonists. Um, and I'm, you know, the fact that he was inserting himself as the male protagonist in those, Oh my God, it's just, I'm sure dozens of academic papers have been written about how problematic Woody Allen's female characters are. And he's certainly had muses and certainly there have been actresses who have taken what he has given them on the page and made. And, and I, and that's the thing that I would lament losing is their work. Um, but what he writes and what, I mean, Annie Hall is just kind of like at the top of that list, but you go through all of his films and it's deeply problematic, deeply problematic. Yeah. As far as he said, she said, we should always believe the she said um, is one thing I'll say. And secondly, I the whole, yeah, the female representations, especially with how they are relating to the male character that is almost always him, at least in his early work, as you said, uh, that's the other, again, the the that's the other reason, the other aspect of this uh, that I'm I, I wouldn't even necessarily I guess say struggling with but but was just grappling with with why I won't return to this movie is again I I think coming at it from the modern context on both the the Woody Allen front but also the the manic pixie dream girl idea that I was projecting onto this it's just yeah, I'm going to not feel guilty anymore. We're, we're we're past any kind of Jewish guilt on this one on my part, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um so what is your with that? What is your next pick? Well, this is one that I, you know, I'm a little embarrassed to admit that I that I'm not a fan of, but you know, the producers, Mel Brooks's um film, the, and I'm specifically talking about the one the, the first one, 1967. The Producers is a film that I think is just an, it is a taste thing. And I, I will just sort of chalk it up to saying that I don't, it's not my taste. Um, and it has nothing to do with, with the fact that it's making jokes about Hitler. I don't really care. And the reason I don't really care is because I actually think that whatever edginess that film may have had when it first came out in the 60s is long gone. The idea of, of cracking jokes about Hitler is it's been done and done. We've done a whole episode on it. It's been done and done and done and done. So there's no edginess to the producers anymore. It's just kind of campy. And it's Mel Brooks. So it's going to be campy. And, and some people love Mel Brooks. I like Mel Brooks. There are other films by Mel Brooks that I like even more. Spaceballs was a childhood favorite. But, you know, I just don't, this just didn't, doesn't do it for me. And 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 no iteration that has ever been done of it, um, whether on stage or on screen, because it's been remade a couple of times has ever done it for me. It just doesn't, I mean, it doesn't land. It just comes, comes across as kind of schmaltzy and campy. And, and I guess um, this is a, this is touchy because in the world of Jewish film, particularly in the world of Jewish comedy, campy and schmaltzy is a major part of, of the, of the trade. Um, and so if you're not into campy schmaltzy, then there's a lot of Jewish comedy that is just not going to sit with you. And I, unfortunately, am not that into campy schmaltzy. Um, so The Producers is just one of those films where, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate its place in history. I appreciate that it was a little edgy at the time that it came out. Um, I just don't enjoy watching it. Um, I feel a little bit like you do. I, I'm not, I don't feel troubled obviously by Mel Brooks it's not the same as Woody Allen but I just don't 
like I watch it and I kind of go, uh, eh, it's not, not my cup of tea. It's not my cup of tea. I don't, I don't actively hate it, but I also don't actively like it. I really just think it's kind of meh camp. Yeah. So I definitely disagree. I, watched this film for the first time, actually, when we were doing our episode on the role of humor in films about Nazis and the Holocaust and World War II. And I I agree that the edginess is, is lost. Um, I think this is a film that, similar to what we were talking about with Exodus, but but kind of flipping it for me, this is a film where I appreciated it and enjoyed it so much because I was sort of putting it in its time and place as a context while watching it. I was thinking, wow, at the time that probably was really offensive. But at the same time, it it was more than that for me. Watching it, I was actually pleasantly surprised at how amusing I still found it. I think Gene Wilder's performance is still hilarious. I think some of what goes on in the production of Springtime for Hitler is still really silly and funny and entertaining. So for me, I was kind of do, I was operating in two modes watching this movie. I was putting it in its time and place, which helped me to kind of appreciate the controversy around it and kind of reclaim some of what was edgy about it and think about that while watching it. But at the same time, I I actually think this is one of the more easily amusing Mel Brooks films, because you mentioned, uh, (laughs) you mentioned loving Spaceballs. And that is actually my next pick for um, a classic that I actively actually hate. So are we ready to, to shift into that? Or do you want to take, well, well, let's, let's shift into it, but let's talk about Mel Brooks a little bit because you picked the space, but I picked the producers. So maybe we should talk about Mel Brooks a little bit because Mel Brooks is on a spectrum and you just alluded to it, which is there are some Mel Brooks films that are genuine. And Mel Brooks has always had a little bit of a cutting quality to his humor, but there are some films of Mel Brooks that are much more biting, much more, much more socially conscious. There, there's a, there's a real strong, sharp cut. And then there's other Mel Brooks films that are just candy. Um, it's just funny candy camp. And I feel like the producers is in this weird place because it started out probably having some quality of edge, but I don't think it had ever any cutting social commentary to it because ultimately it's not about anti-Semitism. It's not about Holocaust. So there's no social justice quality to this film. It's, it's lampooning, Broadway is <laughs> lampooning producers for God's sakes. Well, I I disagree a little bit. It may not be trying to say something about anti-Semitism, but it was, I think, very self-aware of X number of years out from World War II. It it tapped into a kind of cultural, societal sensitivity and took that and said, Well, what do we do now? How do we move forward? What's how is it okay for us to talk about these traumatic aspects of our history? How is it not okay to? And kind of commenting just on a collective trauma and a collective memory in a way that I think I think this plays as a as a satire more than it does as a spoof. And while there are Mel Brooks comedies that are strictly kind of spoofs or parodies that I I really enjoy. I mean, Young Frankenstein, for instance, probably my absolute favorite Mel Brooks movie. Spaceballs, on the other hand, I would like to argue, says pretty much nothing. And it cheapens the already cheap jokes. It makes the easiest jokes in a way that something like the producers, I don't think any of the jokes the producers were making, what it was making light of in a way at the time what it was finding the humor in at the time I think wasn't cheap and wasn't easy I think Spaceballs is the opposite end of that spectrum for Mel Brooks it's the easiest jokes you could find and not saying anything about a genre or not you know barely anything the the one thing 
The one thing in Spaceballs I really liked, I and I will give it this, I really liked the moments where he got a little meta and broke the fourth wall and started making jokes about merchandising. Um, those were my favorite moments in the film. But... I, I Look, I will grant you something about Spaceballs. Um, I will grant you that on the spectrum of Mel Brooks, it is candy. It is not, you know, blazing... It's not blazing saddles. It's not... It is... There's no, you know, it's not talking about racism. It's not talking about income inequality. It's not talking, you know, it's like, it's, 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 it's candy, but um, it's a good candy. I mean, to me, as a kid watching that film, um, it, it made me laugh in a way that a lot of Mel Brooks's earlier stuff was maybe more mature, was maybe on a different level, didn't, didn't hit young Brad the way that Spaceballs did. And, and, you know, it's not necessarily the hardest working Mel Brooks film. It's you're right. It's, it's going for easier jokes because it's candy. I think it's largely candy. However, it is satirizing something. It is spoofing something. And that is the transition that was happening from the late seventies through the eighties of the film business, because you had the studio era and then you had the independent auteur era kind of break the studio system. But that was a very brief window of time. And Mel Brooks had worked in that time. Mel Brooks had become a sort of auteur of in his own right in that time. And then by the time he's making space balls, it's after Star Wars. It's after Jaws. It's after the commodification of franchise filmmaking. And in a way that was almost uh, prescient and, and ahead of its time, Spaceballs is making fun of that. And so when it breaks the fourth wall and gets meta, it's actually talking about, do you want good stories? Do you want fun adventures? Do you want great movies? Or do you want toys? <laughs> and he's 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 picking at the audience he's picking at the at the hollywood studios that had gotten into the business of making movies to make toys and he was doing it at a time where you know in the mid 80s we still had mid-budget films we still had uh, a pretty diverse offering at the cineplex we didn't necessarily have 30 screen multiplexes megaplexes yet but in 10 years we did and in 20 years you can't find any of that stuff. You would never see those films get made because it's all franchise filmmaking. And Spaceballs is, it's just, it's not smart necessarily. I don't think it's like the smartest comedy. It's not the smartest film Mel Brooks has ever made, but it was criticizing something. It was making a very prescient um, critique. Um, and it was, I think, sort of fun to watch as, as a sci-fi loving kid in the eighties. I, you know, I, I, I took, I took the candy and I was like, this tastes great, but that, that, that's taste maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. I, I, so first of all, I appreciate everything that you just kind of broke down about what it was satirizing. Cause for me, that just didn't land. I mean, it landed, like I said, a little bit in those scenes where it was made pretty obvious when they go to see yogurt and he shows them all of these branded. How can you not love yogurt? Uh, I, I, so two things. So one is I do think it is a taste thing because for you to say that it's not Mel Brooks's smartest comedy or for it to not even be necessarily a very smart spoof, that's fine. For me, I just didn't find it funny. Again, I think it took the lowest hanging fruit possible at, at every turn and I was not laughing. <laughs> and so if I'm not going to be laughing, I at least hope that something in it is going to tell me what the point is and so those scenes for me made it less pointless um, as a movie I just I found the characters to be pretty annoying um I was just not amused and I saw this film as a kid and that was before I was the huge Star Wars fan that I am now and I had the same kind of negative reaction to it so taking your advice I rewatched it and maybe now I'm too much of a Star Wars fan because the other thing about this movie that I'll say is that it it treads this weird line where it almost is not different enough from what it's spoofing. Like it's it's trying to really take these characters and these storylines from Star Wars 
but at the same time, and when I say not different enough, I mean something like Young Frankenstein really takes. I'm a huge Frankenstein nerd too, so like it takes the 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 movies and it takes the novel and it and it does something really different and interesting with it, and that's what makes it compelling. In addition to it being funny, Spaceballs is simultaneously too beholden to Star Wars, while also not ever really I found. Uh, making fun of Star Wars. Like I actually wanted it to be even more pointed. Um, you know, I found again that the humor was, was a lot of physical comedy and silly gags. And I wanted it to be saying something more about Star Wars. If that is what it was taking as it's kind of jumping off point to make all of these other, you know, points, um, that you, that you put forth. So that's, that's where I am with, space balls and I don't think you're going to change my mind again I kind of appreciate the depth a little bit more that that you described of those moments that I did like but but it's still not enough for me to feel like this movie is redeemed I I just didn't find it to be the candy that you found it to be and maybe that is a difference in taste I don't know all right well fine Tell me at least that you that you had some enjoyment of Rick Moranis's portrayal. I mean, Rick Moranis is an under undersung actor, comedic actor. Please tell me you at least. I find him. Rick Moranis a little grating in this movie and in general. Oh. So I'm still gonna be the contrarian here and and disagree with you. All right, but all right, um, all right. All right we'll we agree to disagree to at least about Mel Brooks. You. Like the producers, I I, like space I can tell you one one scene. We'll end it with this one scene that wasn't about the merchandising. There was one other scene I did like, and that was late in the film. The weird little nod to Alien and the Xenomorph doing a little dance across uh, a counter at a diner. That is the one very arbitrary, s- silly moment that I actually was laughing at um, that really spoke to me in a way that nothing else in the film besides the merchandising jokes um, did. So it had a couple redeeming qualities, but still kind of hate it. All right. Fine, fine. All right. So that's our list. We hate the things that we hate. We are mad about the things that we're mad. At least on these last two, we'll agree to disagree and leave it and leave it there. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're going to have to. I mean, at least we each certainly got a lot off of our chests. And um, I don't know, hopefully we didn't lose any respect from our listeners over our picks for least favorite Jewish movie classics. I hope not. I I certainly um, hope that they appreciated our critical, critical eye. But until next time, we are your hosts, as ever, Brad Pilcher and Sarah Glassberg. Also producing are Catherine Crosby and Chris Holland, who's also our technical director and editor, and Catherine Cole, our show intern. The music you have been humming to all show long is by the incomparable Joe Alterman. Please look him up wherever you get your music. You can always find more from us as well as show notes at ajff.org slash inconversation. Our email address is inconversation at ajff.org. Drop us a line with questions and we might just answer in future episodes. And don't forget to subscribe in your podcast app of choice or check out our YouTube channel for new episodes. Give us a rating, a review, every little bit helps. Of course, please tell your friends about the show and then goodbye. Goodbye.